So I think this is such a fascinating topic. It was the only time last year during all the shenanigans in Parliament that I had friends asked to come around and watch the Parliamentary Channel, <laughs> which the ratings were soaring as the drama, carefully curated by Mr Burko, got deeper and deeper. <laughs> Um, and of course, those tensions, the, the tensions and the questions raised by the events of last year haven't gone away. Uh, the government may have won this huge 80-seat majority, but still the questions about the constitution, the relationship between parliament and executive, commons and lords, go on. Um, and our panel today is the, are the perfect experts to discuss that. Uh, Lord Norton of Louth has been described as the UK's greatest living expert on Parliament and a world authority on constitutional affairs. He's the Professor of Government and Director of the Centre for Legislative Studies at the University of Hull. He's also a Conservative life peer. Joanna Cherry is the SMP, uh, MP for Edinburgh South West and the party's Justice and Home Affairs spokesperson in the House of Commons. She trained as a lawyer and was involved in the legal challenge to the prorogation of Parliament last year. Meg Russell is also a leading expert on the Constitution. She's director of UCL's Constitution Unit. And Bernard Jenkin, Sir Bernard Jenkin, Tory MP for Harwich and North Essex, is one of his party's most outspoken Eurosceptics, who I gather wasn't, didn't vote in the Huawei vote just now. Because um, I slipped. <laughs> he was one of the Maastricht rebels during John Major's premiership and more recently has been a leading light in the ERG group of Brexiteers. So I'm going to ask the panel in order just to explain in, in five minutes their highlights of what they think the main issues are for the Constitution and Parliament following the departure from the EU. Lord North, would you, Lord uh, Norton, would you start? Well, I thought to try and be different and not overlap with anything that's said before, I'd try and put it in historical perspective, if we're looking at our uh, constitution, I've got five minutes and I'm going to start in the 10th century, so you can see the challenge uh, uh, that it poses. Um, but the key point I want to make is the continuity of our constitutional um, arrangements. Our constitution is remarkable for its uh, longevity, you can trace its roots back to the coronation oath of the uh, uh, 10th century. It's had traumas throughout its history, including the odd existentialist threat, but it has proved remarkable for its endurance. Some see it as not just flexible, but too flexible, lacking any clear shape. But the point I'd stress is it may be battered, but it's not bowed. Some people say it's somewhat elastic, but elastic bounces back. So that element of continuity, I think, is important to stress, because there's a danger of seeing recent events out of uh, context and, and seeing them as uh, uh, too much of a, a challenge. It's important to remember that Parliament's place in our constitution was really determined by three key uh, events. One was the very emergence of Parliament in the 13th century, which fairly quickly established the functions which is held ever since um, in terms of debating legislation demands for supply before giving approval, scrutinising the executive and seeking a redress of grievances. Second key event was the glorious uh, revolution, determining that the king could not make law without the assent of parliament. But parliament still looked to the king to make policy. The onus always rested there, not with parliament itself. And the third key development was the growth of a mass franchise and mass membership political party in the 19th century, facilitating the Westminster model of government, the opposition mode of executive legislative relationships as identified by uh, Tony King, where the two parties use the Chamber of the Commons to fight out over the great issues uh, of the day, but with the government governing, the opposition being the opposition, um, equilibrium legitimacy, recognising the government was entitled to get its business, the opposition was entitled to be heard. What is consistent throughout is that Parliament's role is to respond to demands of the executive, not to substitute policy of its own. So it's essentially always been a reactive legislature, if you like, policy influencing, not policy making. So that, if you like, is the, the deep history. Now, if we move forward very quickly, the challenges that have been faced recently, so a combination, a clash of legitimacies, challenge that position in the last parliament. I want to stress the uniqueness of that. Because you had a clash of di direct democracy in the form of the referendum 
and representative democracy in the form of the 2017 general election. So it resulted in a powerful House of Commons challenging the government for control of policy and a breakdown of accountability. Electors cannot hold themselves to account for the outcome of a referendum, nor can they hold to account a transient majority in the House of Commons. So previously the system produced a coherent body through the doctrine of collective responsibility that stood before the House of Commons to be answerable for its conduct and then before electors. Uh, that essentially went. And it produced not only a powerful House of Commons, but essentially an unpopular, certainly not a trusted House of Commons. There's a mismatch between power and how electors viewed it. Now, that may be transient, and I think it's important to put that in context. Uh, last year, I gave the Bingham Lecture in Constitutional Studies at Oxford, and the lecture was titled, Is the House of Commons Too Powerful? Well, that was a question that in previous years would have seen risible, it would not have been asked. Um, we may be reverting the situation where, again, it's risible. And at the time, it was relevant. But the key point is it's exceptional. We still face a number of major challenges, constitutionally, not least in respect of the Union. But in terms of what's happened in recent years, I think that point was exceptional, that the Parliament's place in the Constitution is relatively well established. We need to recognise that and see it as sort of reverting to the position it's normally held, and I would argue uh, prescriptively should hold, in responding to the demands of the executive, and that what was a, an exceptional combination of events is now passed as a result of the December general e election. So the onus reverts to government, the Commons particularly reverts to its normal role, so whether it does a good job or not is another matter. What I want to establish is what its role is, and that's what uh, it should be doing under our constitution. Joanna Cherry, do you think that's right that Parliament's now been put back in its box, if you like, by the election and Brexit happening? Well, I suppose I would take a very different view of the nature and origins of the British constitution <laughs> from Lord Norton, if I may. Um, and I'd like to begin by reminding people that there are four parliaments in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, not just the Westminster Parliament, but the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh and Northern Irish Assemblies. And I think if you want to understand the role that Parliament plays in the constitution of these nations, you need to try and understand what the modern British constitution looks like uh, and how it works. And I think in doing that, you cannot do that without looking at the difference that devolution has made to the modern British constitution. And, you know, my, my key events would be rather different from Lord Norton's, as somebody who's approaching this from the angle of one half of the United Kingdom, Scotland. And I think we need to try and understand the history of the union between Scotland and England better to understand the nature of the modern British constitution because it would be incorrect to assume that in 1707, England and the English Parliament simply swallowed Scotland and the Scottish Parliament whole. That was not the nature of the Act of Union at all. In fact, the Act of Union went to some lengths to pre preserve distinct Scottish uh, institutions. And uh, this year in Scotland, we are celebrating 700 years since the Declaration of Our Broth, which was the expression of Scotland's nationhood to the Pope then, who was the sort of recognising uh, factor I in Europe. And um, I think it's really important to remember that when Scotland and England came together in a union in 1707, we created a new state, but not a new nation. The two nations remain. And I think it's important also to understand that Scotland, in the same way that England brought its, co its tradition of parliamentary sovereignty to that union, Scotland brought its tradition of the sovereignty of the people. The idea that the monarch, as it was in the Declaration of Our Growth, government in modern times is, is not above the law. But despite that parliamentary sovereignty, we see ourselves in a situation where when people vote in Scotland, as in the 2016 referendum, and indeed all the electoral opportunities since, they've voted for pro-EU parties in enormous numbers, but there's no, recogni no recognition of that at British state level. And indeed, our parliament has voted repeatedly against the statutes which have enabled the withdrawal from the European Union and has been no allowance uh, made for that. 
And I think ignoring the importance of the devolved settlement, trying to pretend it's not part of our modern constitutional settlement, the fact that that's been done leads us to where, to where we are now. And it's interesting to remind ourselves that just a few years ago, pre-Brexit, in the 2016 Scotland Act, it was felt very important in the wake of the independence referendum to amend the Scotland Act to say that the Scottish Parliament was a permanent entity and that it can never be abolished without the consent of the people of Scotland in a, a referendum. So I think if we look at, if we look at the... Parliament and the Constitution simply through the sort of traditional sort of Dicean, very English analysis of the Constitution, it's not going to take us very far. And I think if you look at the Supreme Court's decision in the case that, that I, I was lead petitioner in the Scottish case and Gina Miller uh, le led in the English case, the Miller 2 case, I think it, it shows a more a modern understanding of the Constitution and the position of the British Parliament in that uh, Constitution. And uh, if you look at the Miller 1 case, that was the case about the triggering of Article 50, uh, in that case, um, the Scottish intervention attempted to uh, have the Sewell Convention, the idea that um, the British Parliament won't normally legislate in relation to devolved matters without the consent of uh, the Scottish Parliament, tried to have the fact that that had been put on a statutory footing recognised by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court said, no, it's just a constitutional convention, the wording of the amendment to the Scotland Act doesn't give it any more force than um, a constitutional convention. But my friend and colleague at the Scottish Bar, uh, Aidan O'Neill QC, has argued that he thinks Miller won, was argued and won in the Supreme Court on the basis of a very traditional English constitutional approach, very much formed in the, in the Dicean mode, without any real attempt to understand the difference that devolution has made to the British Constitution. And I think the Miller 2 case and the, and the case that, that uh, I was the lead petitioner in have a rather more refreshing approach to the idea of the modern British Constitution. Um, in, in, that, in those cases, the Supreme Court seemed to have departed from the idea that constitutional conventions are wholly distinct from legal rules. And they've adopted a more, they adopted a more fluid analysis and they held that the enforceable uh, legal principles of the Constitution are not confined to statutory rules, but include constitutional uh, principles developed by the common law, such as the notion of democratic accountability. And so I think the Miller II case and the, case, and the Cherry case, my case, make clear that the UK Constitution is founded on principles of democracy enforceable by the courts. And that should mean that what I would call the Westminster absolutism, the supremacy of parliament above all else, should be a thing of the past. But the reality is that it won't be because of the present prime minister's very significant majority. Now, I know we've had a, a not insignificant rebellion this afternoon, but the reality of the present parliamentary arithmetic is that anything that this executive wants to do, they can get through parliament with really very, very little uh, difficulty. And for all that the argument that the UK constitution is not as dicey described, the reality is that under this prime minister and this government, it will be. Because the devolved parliaments can be ignored. And we've seen that happen already. You know, Holyrood, Stormont and Cardiff all voted against the EU withdrawal agreement 2020, each withheld their legislative consent. Not just the nationalist parties. For example, in Scotland, it was the SNP, the Greens, the Lib Dems and the Labour Party all voted to withhold a legislative consent. And that is by far the bulk of members of the Scottish Parliament. So where you have a situation where the, the modern reality of your constitution uh, can be ignored, uh, then I think, I think, we, I think we, ha we have a problem for parliamentary accountability. And I'll, I'll just finish on this. There's actually a problem for parliamentary accountability at Westminster as well, because... This trade agreement, or this mixed agreement, which we are told is going to be reached by the end of, of the year, uh, the European Parliament will have a meaningful vote on it. The British Parliament won't. And likewise, if and when we reach an agreement with the United States of America, a, tra a trade agreement, the Congress, US Congress, will have a vote on that trade agreement. But because of the limitations of CRAG, the British Parliament won't. So for all that, I think there was a great 
leap forward by the Supreme Court's decision in Miller 2 and the Cherry case in terms of putting the very important uh, principles of accountability and, uh, uh, on the table, I think the reality of the outcome of last year's general election <coughs> will be a, a massive leap backwards. Mayor Russell, do you, what do you think? Do you feel that the pressures uh, are going to be put on the Constitution as a result of Brexit, or is it going to be backed because this is normal now? Well, I'm very troubled by the pressures that have been put on the Constitution to date, and I wanted to start with the, the, the title of this session, The Place of Parliament in the Constitution, and I think you can sum that up in one word, which is central. <laughs> um, and for two primary reasons. First, quite simply, we are a parliamentary democracy, which means that the government is accountable to parliament and can ultimately be removed uh, by a vote of no confidence in the House of Commons, unlike in, for example, presidential systems. Um, that's quite common. Most of Europe and the Commonwealth has those kind of arrangements, but we also have the rather more unique feature of our tradition of parliamentary sovereignty, which does mean that there is supposed to be no higher authority than Parliament, no written constitution, no ability of the courts to strike down primary legislation. Um, so I would say as a, as a comparative scholar in part, um, the legislature is absolutely central to any democracy. It's the key representative and law-making body in the state. You can't be a democracy without having a legislature. But in the UK, this centrality is greater, indeed uniquely great, because of the combination of these two factors. So I find it very troubling that Parliament's role became so widely contested during the Brexit process. And I think this is something that we should really worry about. Um, throughout the process, there were concerns expressed that Parliament was acting in conflict with the will of the people. There was some basis for that concern, but also I think some significant misunderstandings. And oddly, I would suggest these included misunderstandings about what exactly we mean by parliament. The obvious conflict was the one between decision-making in a referendum, direct democracy, and our more traditional decision-making by parliament through representative democracy. Um, the setup was awkward. This is very familiar because the referendum was an in-principle vote to leave but there was no clear prospectus for leave, and it remained then for uh, the government and parliament to work this out. At the beginning, um, the government sought to proceed without much parliamentary involvement by using its prerogative powers. Um, the Supreme Court ruling in Miller 1 put parliament back at the center with respect to the triggering of Article 50, <coughs> Um, and something similar happened with respect to the second, the, the Miller-Cherry case, um, overturning the prorogation, putting Parliament in the centre. These um, conflicts, um, these cases brought our core in constitutional bodies into conflict, Parliament, government, and the courts. But the central conflict was between the government on the one hand and Parliament and the courts on the other, the courts re, uh, intervened to reinstate the centrality of Parliament. Nonetheless, some of those who vociferously defend our uh, traditions of parliamentary democracy were offended by these outcomes. So how could that be? Well, I think this is the first of two ways in which these recent debates show a lack of clarity regarding the most fundamental question of how we define Parliament itself. It's often said that despite its official centrality, our parliament is weak and subordinate to the executive. My work has challenged that. Um, I suggest that parliament is actually more influential and influential in more subtle ways than people often assume. But it is a fact that many people believe parliamentary sovereignty actually means executive sovereignty. And recent events have challenged that coming together. Minority government made it significantly harder for the government to get its way in Parliament than usual. The norm when ministers have a majority in the House of Commons is that Parliament and government tend to speak with one voice. That fell apart over Brexit, raising the question of whose sovereignty should prevail. Should it be ministers or should it be Parliament itself? Some who would generally profess to support parliamentary sovereignty clearly thought ministers should prevail. The Prime Minister, for example, at the time. But the confusion went wider than that, I think. A minister's position was weaker than simply being a minority government. After all, with the support of the DUP, in theory, the government had a majority in the House of Commons. 
But of course, Brexit was also hugely divisive within the governing party, which led to the second confusion, I suggest, by what we mean by Parliament. Time and again, we heard that Parliament was standing in the way of Brexit. But Parliament isn't a monolith. It's actually a complex institution which speaks with many voices. Anthony King has already been mentioned by Philip Norton. He famously pointed out decades ago that it's a nonsense to see Parliament and government as completely separate. The government is drawn from Parliament and relies on its backbenchers to get its business through. In terms of adversaries, um, the opposition is usually fairly irrelevant uh, if the government has the support of its own MPs. But on Brexit, it didn't. Uh, not just once, but three times. As we know, Theresa May's deal was blocked in the Commons, but it would have passed if Conservative MPs and DUP MPs had supported it. Theresa May's response was to angrily blame Parliament, setting herself up as the defender of the people against MPs. But the MPs blocking her were her own backbenchers, and most of them weren't actually anti-Brexit. They were people like Bernard, who thought that her deal was wrong. They didn't think Parliament was getting it wrong. They thought the fault lay with the Prime Minister, yet Parliament got the blame. The present Prime Minister and various of his ministers were among this group, but when they took over, they didn't defend Parliament's actions. They continued to blame it. The December Conservative Manifesto criticised, quote, the failure of Parliament to deliver Brexit. But who exactly was this Parliament. Wasn't it in fact the previous government that had failed to deliver? This last couple of years have seen more anti-parliamentary rhetoric than I think I've seen in the whole of the rest of my life combined. Parliamentarians have been described in the headlines as saboteurs, mutineers and wreckers and the Commons has been told by a senior minister that it had no moral right to sit. <laughs> but coming back to the start, Parliament lies at the heart of our constitution, and if we don't have a parliament that commands public support, we don't have a functioning democracy. Parliament got the blame, in my view, often unfairly for the Brexit crisis. I think now, whichever side of that divide you are on, rebuilding faith in our parliament is now a burning priority. Bernard Jenkins, do you want to address that point that, you know, what is sovereignty? Who, where does sovereignty reside? And is it whatever you want it to be? You know, some Brexiteers take sovereignty to be their sovereignty, whereas Remainers want it to be their sovereignty. And the government always insists it's the executive. Well, I mean, um, actually what you're referring to is the competing legitimacies to which Lord Norton uh, referred to. And uh, if you overlay a traditional representative system of government, which is what we've got, with direct democracy. And then direct democracy arrives at the decision that the majority of the representatives didn't want. Well, there, there, were, there was the conflict set up. And a lot of what Meg is uh, referring to about people, what people have said and invoked in Parliament, and I think we need to separate um, uh, three distinct things. One is... Um, what the law actually is. Secondly, uh, what, the, what, what people invoke in order to try and gain legitimacy for their argument. And finally, uh, underneath all that, there are, the way the Constitution actually works is there are a lot of understandings, uh, and particularly in a Constitution where uh, not much is written down, uh, there are a lot of ways of doing things, which are sort of cultural almost, um, expectations, um, which just the way things work, and in our system that is particularly how our system works. Um, but in the, even if you look at the American Constitution, uh, it's a very ancient document, the, the American Constitution, and it only works in the modern world because there are, you know, uh, it's overlaid with a whole lot of expectations and understandings that basically makes the thing function. Now, the, the, the salient features of this turbulent period we've been through is, first of all, the very divisive issue about our membership of the European Union, which has not just um, divided parties and politicians, it's sort of shattered the consensus about, you know, the very identity of this country. Um, you know, a whole lot of things that we never usually talked about suddenly became very important. Um, secondly, uh, this mismatch between competing legitimacies. And thirdly, um, 
uh, the fact that the government of the day didn't have a majority. And um, Disraeli had an expression, uh, England does not like coalitions. What he really meant was uh, it likes governments with majorities where things happen. And you know, whether you agree with it or not, whether you like our voting system or not, um, the, you know, as soon as the general election was over, yes, some people were in despair, some people were jubilant, but across the country there was a sort of palpable sense of relief that you know, something at last was over, something was settled. And I think that's one of the things that are, you know, that 10 centuries, 11 centuries of constitutional development uh, that we're really adapted to. We don't like everything being upset and very divisive. Um, in the same way as after... Uh, the English Civil War and the Commonwealth, you know, suddenly we had Charles II and a sort of semblance of things being back the same they, the way they were before, but with some very fundamental but subtle changes. Everyone was happy again. And um, uh, I, I think there's um, a, a very sort of practical sentiment at the, way, at the heart of the way our constitution operates. Now, having said that, as I say, the, um, uh, you know, the, there's a big confusion about what the expectation is, and, and I'm a parliamentarian, and I please, believe passionately in parliament, to answer your question, um, practical sovereignty in a democracy rests with the people. I'm at one with Joanna on that. Um, uh, but constitutionally and legally, sovereignty rests with parliament, in that parliament can make and unmake any law. Um, and there is nothing, there is no court, there is no decision of any minister that can undo that fact. Um, so Parliament, in the Dicean sense, it may be uh, irk a certain genre of, uh, of uh, judge, but Parliament can, in fact, do anything legally. Uh, whether it has legitimacy is another matter. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the one thing, that, the other ingredient <coughs> that really made the situation uh, fraught was um, we've grown up with a system where uh, the House of Commons has always been able to dismiss Parliament, and and uh, the government has already been able to, always been able to invoke the confidence principle uh, to dissolve parliament um, uh, as a pretext for dissolving parliament. And no one's ever contested that until we had the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. And then we had this <coughs> new kind of paralysis, uh, which I described as uh, an ability. We had a House of Commons that would wound but would not kill, uh, that would constantly strike the government's legitimacy, but when invited to strike it down, would not do so. And indeed, we got to the uh, we, we 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 demonstrated the absurdity of the fixed term parliaments act when the government finally introduced a bill to get a, a general election by a majority of one as opposed to a two thirds majority, and even the Labour Party at that point crumbled and realised if they didn't vote for it, they would look completely stupid. So in a, in a way, the 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 the, 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 the system was constantly reversing reverting to type. Meg is right that the parliament is central, and Joanna is right. If the government has a majority, Parliament is supreme. And, um, uh, and, in, and indeed, uh, I think that's what the Scottish people voted to remain part of in the referendum in 2014. Um, <laughs> Don't and, think uh, so. Um, I can assure but, you that's not but, the case. But, but um, I think par Parliament and government would be very wise in the present circumstances to be very mindful that we now live in a, in a United Kingdom of competing sovereignties. Uh, where the sovereignty of the Scottish people, which we recognise in the, that one question of the referendum, is a latent political force and, if provoked, would maybe vote a different way in a future referendum. Um, just just add, 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 add two other short things. One is, we tend to think about this business called the separation of powers as though it is a good thing or it is, um, uh, it is intrinsically a feature of any democratic constitution. Actually, Montesquieu uh, took that concept to the uh, framers of the American constitution, uh, misunderstanding how our constitution works. We don't have a separation of powers. And indeed, if you look at the American constitution, they don't have a separation of powers. The president appoints the judges. Uh, the, the Congress approved the judges. The President vetoes legislation. The President can stay in office even if it's lost the confidence of the Congress, um, and, and so on. Um, the, uh, the, the, in a way, our, our system is more fused and, one could argue, much more accountable uh, than a system that is admired in far more lawyers and, and courts. And the other thing is about the role of the courts. Um, 
Um, I, I actually thought Miller 1 was an odd judgment. Um, because I mean, it was very handy uh, because it uh, gave Parliament the opportunity to vote on, 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 on a matter which it had not been invited to vote on, and it legitimised the result of the referendum uh, in a way that uh, we hadn't anticipated. But um, it was odd that um, whenever I'd been dealing with a treaty before, it had always been a courtesy of Parliament to allow government to pass the legislation before uh, enacting um, uh, before ratifying a European treaty. But it, was never, it had never been before deemed necessary or legally required. Um, and um, uh, it, is, it has always been a convention that if a treaty requires legislative effect, then it, the legislation should go through Parliament before it's ratified. That had never been a legally enforceable principle before. So that was an invention by the courts. And um, Miller too. I mean, let me just read you this extract. We've been very careful not to criticise the judgments because we don't want to politicise judiciary. But Miller too said uh, that, uh, that a decision to prorogue will be unlawful if the prorogation has the effect of frustrating or preventing, without reasonable justification, the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions. Well, Parliament's constitutional functions has never been a legally definable concept in our history before. Um, what are these constitutional functions in legal terms? And um, um, uh, it was, uh, it was, and it was a very odd judgment in, a, in that it didn't refer at all to the lower court, uh, chaired by the Lord Chief Justice, uh, which had reached unanimously exactly the opposite conclusion. Um, and I think that um, uh, the reason why uh, there is some discussion about uh, the, what what the courts should be doing and what they should not be doing is because the courts have taken a very much more expanded role. It's got the title Supreme Court, the same as the American Supreme Court, which definitely is a constitutional court. When the Supreme Court was set up by Tony Blair, we were told it was not going to be a constitutional court. Um, so there is some ambiguity there. Um, and uh, I think uh, just as a, uh, a coda, I would refer to the Reith Lectures. I mean, um, uh, Lord Sumption was far too diplomatic to criticize either of the Miller judgments. But um, uh, his basic thesis that certain things are political and sh should be settled by political means, and certain things and matters of law should be settled by the courts. I mean, his, the most glaring example being where the issue of abortion was settled by political means in a referendum in Ireland, it is settled. Where um, the issue of abortion is constantly fought through the courts in the United States, um, starting with Roe v. Wade, it has never been settled. And if you want um, a system of politics and a system of government that operates by consent, then democratic processes should be to the fore and the courts uh, should be interpreting what, uh, in our case, what <coughs> Parliament wants it to interpret, it, not what the courts choose to take, uh, take to themselves. Thank you. Do you worry about the union or do you feel it's a price for I do worry about the Brexit? union. I think the biggest problem about the union, uh, and particularly now we've got a majority again, is the sheer tactlessness with which uh, central government and the Westminster Parliament conducts itself with regard to the devolved nations. And of course, that is the, um, uh, the meat and drink of the nationalist movements, uh, that they take offence at every op opportunity, even where no offence is intended. But um, uh, uh, I, I do worry about the fate of the Union, but um, I don't anticipate there's going to be a referendum in Scotland again, uh, in this Parliament at least. Joanna, I'm sure you'll disagree with that, but I wanted to ask you about the courts mm. and whether you were worried about Boris Johnson uh, uh, and his plans to uh, take on the judiciary uh, and re re I judicial review. I am, yes, review. but I'm going to come back, if, you, if I may, on what Bernard said, because it can't just be let lie. Um, you said, Bernard, during your opening remarks, that what the Scottish people have got what they voted for in 2014. I said what? You said the Scottish people have got what they voted for when they voted to remain part of the Union in 2014. Mm -hmm. I noted you saying that. Mm -hmm. Now, I would disagree with that, but you'd say, of course I would. But my, a lot of my constituents who voted no would disagree with that. And that's what people in the British establishment need to be aware of now. You know, I represent one of the most middle class seats in Scotland, probably the most middle class seat. I increased my majority from 1,000 to 12,000 at the last general election. And I know, because I knocked a lot of doors in the middle-class suburbs of Edinburgh, I know what no voters think 
of your party and your government. And they don't think they got what they voted for in 2014 because they were promised they would be an equal partner in the United Kingdom. Yet everything Scotland votes for and everything its parliament was voted for is ignored. They were promised they would remain part of the European Union if they voted to remain part of the UK. That promise has been broken. And they were told that they shouldn't leave the United Kingdom but stay and lead the United Kingdom. And I don't think even the most dedicated contortionist could say that Scotland leads the United Kingdom at present. So it's very foolish, if I may say so, to assume that the difficulties in Scotland are merely the product of nationalism. Many of us in Scotland believe in self-determination. And I won't make any apology for saying that I would write, like to restore my nation's statehood because I feel that the state I am currently part of routinely ignores the votes of my fellow countrymen and women, by which I mean people who live in Scotland, not the Scots. Now, to get back to your question about Boris Johnson, yes, I am worried about Boris Johnson's interference with the courts, and I disagree with you again, Bernard, that the, the, the uh, function of Parliament is not clear in the British Constitution. I'd like to quote what Lord Drummond Young, a very distinguished, recently retired uh, Scottish judge, said in the inner house in the Cherry case. He said, the courts cannot subject the actings of the executive to political scrutiny, but they can and they should ensure that the body charged with performing that task, Parliament, is able to do so. So I would say it's reasonably clear, and I think we could probably most of us agree, that in the modern British constitution, the function of Parliament is to scrutinise the executive. Now, most of us understand that the reason why Boris Johnson suspended Parliament last year, or tried to do so for a lengthy period of time, was he didn't like the scrutiny to which he was being subjected. I'm sure he doesn't have much problem with the scrutiny to which he's being subjected at the moment, because it's not up to much, frankly, because he's just got a lot of lobby fodder on his benches. Um, so I think his attempt to... Uh, emasculate the courts is because he sees he's now got Parliament squared, but he's worried that there might be scrutiny from another body. And I think it's, um, I mean, your discussion about what the separation of powers means is interesting, Bernard, and I agree with you that in America it's not nearly as clear as we perhaps were taught as un undergraduates. But just because it's not clear in America doesn't mean to say that it's not a, a notion that has merit that there should be checks and, and balances. And I would simply argue that in a situation where we have a parliament, a, a, an executive with such an enormous majority, a majority that's not reflected in all parts of the union, then it's all the more necessary to have courts which can step in where appropriate to provide the necessary checks and balances. So I think there'll be wide resistance to any attempt to tie the hands of the courts. But I suspect it will succeed because uh, unlike uh, the Conservatives we saw on the benches in the last Parliament, many of whom behaved with great dignity and courage, I'm afraid this lot uh, will be whipped to support just about anything. We've just got five minutes, five or ten minutes for questions. I don't know if there's one, two, three. We'll take three once. There's one gentleman there, gentleman here and gentleman there. Yes, uh, in America, there's a concept of faithless delegates, faithless electors, people who don't vote the way they've been uh, instructed to for the candidate. Uh, it's in an electoral college. And a word I haven't heard today, I've been through all the way, is the word manifesto or uh, election address, where us punters actually get a chance to have a say, to, to agree or disagree with what your program is. And how can you say that the last parliament had any legitimacy when MPs completely ignored the manifestos and, and, and election statements they were elected on? Uh, there was a question over here. Um, Looking at the, the triangle that the panel has been um, discussing between the, the, the Crown, the government, uh, Parliament and the courts, historically, for the last 150 years or so, the Conservatives have stood up for the, the little man, the little person 
against overweening government. Do you think that the suspicion of judicial review now reflects something sort of knee-jerky like a response to the, uh, the Miller and Cherry cases and the courts getting it wrong in the eyes of the government? Or is there actually a shift uh, in respect of judicial accountability, um, which you could more familiarly have seen Conservatives disliking a growing left-wing government treading on the, the citizens' toes. But that pressure is now coming more from the Conservatives than from the other parties. And then there was a question over here. Uh, yeah. um, but Bernard, you said something that was akin to the good chap theory of government. Um, and I wonder if the current Prime Minister, from his previous actions and likely going forward, certainly in relation to Scotland, is being a good chap. <laughs> Bernard, do you want to take that one first? Quickly? Well, um, um, I, I think that um, the capacity for Whitehall um, to do things uh, which are blind to the offence that they cause in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is unbelievably big. I mean, the classic was the publication of the withdrawal bill, the EU withdrawal bill, with the very controversial Clause 11, uh, on less than 24 hours' notice by a telephone call from the minister concerned to his Scottish counterpart. I mean, it, it couldn't have been done. Uh, and given how much... I mean, I, I, I mean I, you didn't mention in, my, in the introduction, I, I chaired the Constitutional Affairs Committee for, for five years in the last parliament, and a great deal of our work was about well, why has it got to be like this? Why isn't there proper structures for dialogue and discussion? Why is the um, Joint Ministerial Committee not a statutory body? Why isn't there an interparliamentary body for the four parliaments in the United Kingdom? You know, given that... And that my starting point was extremely open-minded. It was, you know, whatever the future of the United Kingdom, there's going to need to be very good relationships between the four parliaments and the four governments of the United Kingdom. Um, and so, we, you know, even the nationalist, uh, the Scottish national member of our committee was very engaged in this discussion and we produced a very consensual report. Um, that should be the way that we train Whitehall to operate. But if you just rely on good chaps, I'm afraid we need a cultural change in Westminster and Whitehall, which is going to be very difficult to achieve, um, probably more difficult to achieve now that there's a, a large majority. And uh, a, a, a part of the sadness of this polarisation of Conservatives into England, though we've got six times more seats than we had at one stage and a million times more seats than we had at a previous stage in, that, um, in Scotland, that, um, uh, that it's going to be easier for the government to sort of um, ride roughshod. So I'm, I don't think we can rely on the good chap theory of government. Those were your words, not mine. Mick, do you want to answer that question about trust and the manifestos that... Yeah, well, I, th I think that that um, touches on um, one of the things that I was saying in terms of, I think it's really important looking back to disentangle what exactly this parliament was that didn't deliver on the will of the people. Um, and in terms of manifestos, I mean, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's great to be here with Bernard, who is very, very thoughtful on these matters. In terms of the Conservative manifesto, I think that the Prime Minister thought she was delivering on the manifesto, and you thought that you wanted something different, no, which you thought was in line with the manifesto. So one of the things that I've recently written says, I mean, this is to put it rather bluntly, that something that was essentially an internal argument in the Conservative Party turned into a process where Parliament got the blame for it going wrong. And I think that's very unfortunate. I mean, I think that Theresa May through the process, she came in for some criticism in the previous session, and you don't want to throw too much mud at one person. I think that one of the difficulties was that Theresa May didn't want to blame her party for not supporting her policy. So her preferred route was to blame Parliament mm. instead. So what she was in effect doing, I mean, you know, she was a very loyal, tribal person, but I think that she slightly trashed the reputation of our central uh, constitution or us, the central institution in our constitution in order to kind of protect um, the reputation of her party. You know, these were people who were standing on one manifesto and they could not agree on the interpretation and the implementation of that manifesto. 
Philip, do you want to take the question about judicial review? Do you feel that we're in danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Well, there's a danger of that because, I mean, the, the key point, the fundamental point, is not just judicial review, but it's wider about referendums. There's the danger of constitutional principles being subordinate to particular policy preferences. Now, it was ever thus, it was Irish Home Rule, and of course, Dicey suddenly came round to the idea of referendums because he wasn't getting what he wanted through the existing policy process. And I always got very frustrated when I argued against referendums. And colleagues came up saying, I so agree with you, I'm so against referendums, except on X. <laughs> and of course, X was the policy outcome that you would not manage to achieve through existing parliamentary <laughs> um, processes. So we've got to be careful, we've got to protect, I think, our uh, existing uh, arrangements. I mean, Dicey did recognise parliamentary sovereignty was legal sovereignty, he recognised popular sovereignty, that there's a relationship between the two, and normally there wasn't a conflict that through parliament the people would get the outcome they wanted, which comes back to the point about manifestos and accountability, which is why the last part was so problematic, because normally a party stands on a particular manifesto, it's got a platform, it's elected, people can hold it to account at the next election whether it's delivered or not, but for that you need a clear entity, the party and government responsible for public policy. That's why it's been so fundamentally challenged. So we do need to stand back, be clear on the constitutional principles and not start... Um, eroding them. I mean, Tom Bingham was right in the rule of law and the relationship, I think, between parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law. There is a potential conflict. Normally, as Dicey recognised there, in unison, there's not a conflict. But at times there is. There are jur jurists like Stein, Laws, Hope and Craighead who've been nibbling away at it. Mm -hmm. But the general view of the uh, judiciary remains upholding, as Tom Bingham did, um, the doctrine of, of, of parliamentary sovereignty. Um, for reasons of time I won't expand that point, but it is covered in my next book being published in May. <laughs> <laughs> well that's fantastic. I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you very much to all our speakers and thank you for coming. And this will go on for hours. <laughs>